Hey everybody, welcome back to the High Performance Zone. Today I have Mindy Shire, who is actually changing the world. We say that a lot. She's doing it through adaptive clothing. And when we dive into this, I had no idea that there are over a billion people who identify themselves with a disability, and yet clothing hasn't caught up to this uh, challenge that we have. And she is changing the world. She's got contracts with the biggest brands, Tommy Hilfinger. We, she just announced she was on The View and just announced it with uh, Victoria's Secrets. Uh, we get into, though, the opportunity that she discovered when her own son, uh, who does have challenges, said, Mom, I just want to wear jeans one day. And he couldn't. And she's changing the world in fashion by doing this. It empowers people. It brings confidence. Clothing can make you feel better. And she is doing this. By the way, her companies are called Runway of Dreams. And they do fashion shows with adaptive uh, people who, who need the challenges. And this is physically, emotionally, many different things. But then she started Gamut Talent Management so that those people, the people that have disabilities, have a, a voice. And they not only have a voice, they have a job, and they're making a difference in the world. Uh, this is one of the most powerful hours that I've spent with somebody who is uh, not only figured out that there's a need out there, but how to make a difference. So with that, let's join Mindy and Gucci on The Zone. Here we go. Hey everybody, I am so excited because I have Mindy Shire with me right now. Mindy, first off, you look fabulous. All right. I love Thank that. You. Hat. I love that hat. And uh, most importantly, I love how you're changing the world and making it such a better world with uh, people that have adaptive challenges and clothing. And I just am excited to dive into how this all started. So first off, how are you feeling today? How are you feeling right now? I feel amazing. I have to tell you, I First of all, I'm so grateful to be on the show. So thank you so much for having me and, and being such an incredible support to share the story. But it's, um, it's a really exciting time in the world, I think specifically in the fashion industry yep. to see uh, such enormous change happen. So I'm, I'm great. Well, Mindy, uh, I love, I just got goosebumps because I, I feel your energy. Uh, <laughs> What I did is I saw your show on The View. I saw uh, what you did, by the way. You're, you're, you are on fire right now. Let's do this real quick. Uh, okay. I want to hear your origin story. I want to know where this all started. But first off, just give the audience a very quick overview of what are you doing out there in the world right now? And how's it going? So first of all, just to be authentic, to make sure everybody gets to enjoy this podcast, I'm going to do an accessibility uh, just review that I am a white woman with curly red hair. I'm wearing a denim blue fedora and a bright yellow uh, puff sleeve top. And I am actually proud to say that I'm 50 years old. So thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> so hey, first off, Mindy, I would have never guessed you're 50. Uh, okay, how old do you think I am? I will say 55. Thank you. I did that on purpose. I'm 62. Yes. And yeah. So let's I love go. it. Yes. Good. I, I hope I, I hope that's what people guess about me when uh, I'm 52. I would have never thought you're 55, but it's always, you know, we always underguess anyhow to play yeah. it safe. But uh, uh, anyhow, over to your story. You're changing the world. Uh, how are you doing that? So I am actually a fashion designer by trade. I'm also the mom of three amazing kids. My middle child, Oliver, was born with a rare form of muscular dystrophy. And when he was young, we, my husband and I realized that he was going to struggle with everyday tasks, one of which is the very thing I love more than anything, and that's getting dressed every day. For him, it was a daily reminder of what he could not do, which are buttons and zippers and putting on shoes, tying laces, all of the above. Yes. So when he was of school age, he wore sweatpants every day. It was really the only way we knew he'd be able to go to the bathroom on his own. He'd be able to fit his leg braces underneath the pants. And when he was eight years old, he came home from school and said, mom, I want to wear jeans. I want to have choice. I want to be able to wear what other people get to wear. And truly it was a, a huge kick in the stomach moment. Mm -hmm. um, not only as a 
a designer in the industry, but as a mom that I needed my eight-year-old to remind me of how critically important clothing is to who you are as a person, how you show up to the world, how you identify yourself. Mm -hmm. And I needed my eight-year-old to remind me of that. So that night, I ripped apart a pair of his jeans, replaced the zipper with some Velcro and creative stitching. I cut up the side seams to go around his leg braces and utilized the Velcro again. And the next morning, it was the first time he had ever been able to independently dress himself wow. and go into school wearing anything that wasn't a sweatpant. And, and really what that experience did was open my eyes to the fact that if Oliver was struggling with this at eight years old, how in the world did the one billion people on our planet who have a disability, how did they manage clothing challenges? So this was back in 2013 and I decided to have a small goal of changing the fashion industry to be inclusive of people with disabilities. And I started the Runway of Dreams Foundation um, <clears throat> excuse me, with really the notion of educating the industry on, first of all, who people with disabilities are, the right. size of the population, the spending power of the population, and the fact that changes could be made to clothing, mainstream clothing, to make it more wearable for people with disabilities. I took an entire year just to do research because I knew I couldn't go to the industry without really understanding what I was talking about. And I only knew my world with Oliver. I didn't know what somebody with a limb difference or that was in a wheelchair full time or Down syndrome. Did they have the same challenges that Oliver did? And fortunately, after that year, I was able to extrapolate out that there were commonalities between vastly different disabilities and clothing challenges. And I developed modifications that could be implemented into mainstream clothing. And I'm so lucky that in 2016, we partnered with Tommy Hilfiger yes. and developed the first ever mainstream adaptive clothing line that is now called Tommy Adaptive. Actually, behind me is one of the first prototypes that we ever did. You'll see that this looks exactly like the typical Tommy button front shirt. Yeah. But behind the buttons are magnets. Wow. So this closes on its own and truly makes it more wearable for so many more people yeah. to be able to wear this product. And one little fun fact that I always like to say is that, do you know when the button and the buttonhole was developed? No, I, that's a great question. Yeah. Tell take me. a guess. Just take a guess. The button. Okay. I'm thinking I'm, I'm looking at TV, you know, old, old uh, shows. Uh, of people wearing fancy clothes and uh, definitely in the, you know, 1700s. I'm guessing the button was developed in the 1584. Good one. In the 13th century. Okay. And the fact that we are still using this technology in our day and age is absurd. Right. So it's really a tremendous opportunity to marry technology and fashion to equal this notion of adaptive product. So the, because of the enormous outpouring after our collaboration with Tommy, suddenly all these other brands started reaching out to Runway Dreams to get involved and how do they get into the um, adaptive space? So much so that I knew a second company needed to be born and that was Gamut Management which is a management company that is a consulting arm as well as a talent management company exclusively for people with disabilities. So Great. we have over 800 talent from around the world that have all different types of disabilities, ethnicities, ages that are really helping companies understand how to create this product, how to understand the population and really develop something with the end user. Oh, wonderful. By the way, you just cut out um, audio wise. <laughs> Want to make sure uh, we got you video. Let's see. Try again. Say something. Hi, I'm so Yeah, happy. you're good. No, okay. just, a, okay. just a little lapse there. Um, oh, it probably was on me. Sorry, you're, you're looking good. I just got a, a thing saying my internet's unstable. Oh. Okay. <laughs> but anyhow, real quick, uh, what an amazing 
story. Okay, I, here's what I want to do, because uh, I'm not sure if everybody knows just how successful you are right now. I mean, you are crushing it. We're making a difference with so many of the big brands. If you think about it, you know, uh, I would say, wow, what a vision you had, uh, because look at the, the market size. We're, we're going to unpack this in a little, in a, in a lot of ways, but I want to go back to that moment, that emotional moment where Oliver, you know, probably looked at you and said, mom, I want to wear jeans. And I bet you that was a, a, a very transformative moment for you as a mom, right? No question about it. It was, it was transformative as a mom and as a human. Yeah. I, and of course, somebody that was embedded in the fashion industry that never once did anybody ever think about somebody with a disability, somebody that was missing a limb? How in the world did they do a button? Right. And it was so profound. And at the same time felt, I don't want to say simple, but for lack of a better word, simple. Yeah. Like how could we not fix this to make it easier for more people to wear the same product? Um, so yes, absolutely. On so many levels, it, it was a turning point in my life. Well, here's what I, what I also love is, uh, you know, it is, it's one of those V8 moments, you know, like, yes. I, mean, I can't believe someone hasn't thought of this before. Right. But more importantly, your approach to it and, you know, really building a business out of it. Cause I, I can't, I can't wait to unpack, uh, what you learned other than it's a great idea. Well, we all have great ideas, but not a, well, I mean, you it's anybody can have a great idea, but making that idea into reality is a challenge sometimes, right? And oh, yeah. and that's and you did it, and I can't wait. So um, very quickly, what 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 goes through my head is all right. So you're 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 now a, a mom of eight. Oliver was eight. Did you say eight years old? At the time now he's seventeen. Seventeen. So yeah, but still a nine years when people uh, realize the empire that you've built, and more importantly, the good that you're doing, especially uh, with your management and bringing everybody, you know, in this inclusivity and, and getting people aware. It's just it's phenomenal. It's it's a heartwarming story, but it's also a good business. So what did you do when you when you realized that okay, there's an opportunity here? You said you took a year to research it. Um, what exactly did you do and what is the size of the market that, that you, you identified? So what I did during that year is first of all, get myself acclimated in the population of people with disabilities. I, I, it did not feel authentic for me to even think about representing a population if I wasn't fully embedded and truly could speak the language could understand the difference between cerebral palsy and muscular dystrophy and, and MS and all the different nuances and how that you know, affected um, your body and how you know, ultimately that translated to dressing yourself. Mm -hmm. So I, it, it really became um, a, a journey of doing a tremendous amount of focus groups, surveys. I went to schools, I went to hospitals, I went to facilities that really um, catered to people with disabilities and, and just educated myself and, and listened. I did a tremendous amount of listening that year um, <clears throat> to be able to formulate if I was really onto something or not, or maybe this is why it had never happened before because it was so complex. Um, and of course, I, I'm so grateful for that because not only did it allow me to <clears throat> speak authentically about the population, it also allowed me to understand the size of the market. So again, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> allergies are so bad. <clears throat> we have roughly a billion people globally that identify with having a disability, which means that number is actually so much bigger. Because Wait a, minute, there's a billion people. people, and how many, there's only what, 8.7 billion people on the planet? I'm not sure, I just guessed. How many people are on the planet? Um, I think you're you're fairly close, I think. Um, but in terms of the the notion of people with disabilities, I think it's actually over a billion. Um, and it's the largest minority on the planet by far. If you think about it, every single minority out there has people with disabilities in the minority sector. So yeah. when you put that all together, it it 
supersedes any minority out there. And, yeah. you know, one of the most, in my mind, mind blowing aspects is it's also the only minority that every single one of us could be a part of at any stage yeah. of life. You can't say that about any other minority out there. Wow. And that, that's factual, whether it's just getting old, getting arthritis, you have an accident during your life, you have a surgery that didn't go well. Um, even if it's from a temporary perspective, everybody is going to experience some type of disability during their lifetime. And then, and when you take a step back from that and you think from a business perspective, how in the world are we not developing product right. for our largest population, number one, and number two, something that we as individuals will need at some point in our life? Wow. Well, you got a, a compelling story. I could see you saying this to the uh, the brands and I could see why you got some traction because <laughs> it only makes sense, right? I mean, yes. when, when you lay it out. And that's what I mean is like, I can't believe, like you said, that someone hadn't thought of it. You know, what goes to my mind real quick. And that is a little side tangent is it's all about, you know, on advertising and marketing, when do these new ideas come out? And then you go, you look back and you kind of go, well, wait a minute. Why didn't we know that earlier? I think about, you know, hockey games on the ice, you know, in the old days, if you look at hockey games, you, um, you actually don't see any marketing on the ice or on the field. And now it's standard, you know, there's marketing. And, and, and even now we can do it, you know, with projections and stuff, football games and all that kind of stuff. And I just thought back to myself, who was the first person that said, hey, let's put a logo under the ice, you know? And once they did it, it, it was like, oh, shoot, we could have been doing that for a long time. You even have a bigger, that, that's, that's trivial compared to what you're doing, right? And, uh, and, and it's so powerful. So real quick, I, I, I apologize to, your, to our listeners that I didn't catch on quicker. Um, I'm a white male. I'm bald, okay? I'm actually bald, but I'm wearing a black t-shirt and it says, glad to be here. And there's a reason I'm wearing the glad to be here. Uh, it's really the ethos of, uh, of the way I live my life. And, and we'll talk more about that. But now we're both on, uh, on, on equal footing. Thanks for, for, for teaching me. Um, anyhow, real quick, back to the, the market. So you're sitting there and, and you're doing this all by yourself, right? This is listening or is, are people helping? you? Um, and the research phase, I am I'm plowing through, hoping I'm doing it right. Yeah. Uh, it just all kind of made sense to me. Yeah. Um, that this is how people learn, right? By, by talking to other people, by understanding and asking questions and listening. So what uh, were some of the questions that you needed to ask? I, it really, first of all, I started kind of broad out okay. here that I truly wanted to understand physically, cognitively, how does it relate to the notion of dressing yourself? What does it take? Okay. to to physically or cognitively put a button through a buttonhole. And did that cause challenges with dressing? That was a pretty, pretty easy answer to get. And it was yes, yeah. almost, you know, a, across the board. And then um, it, it got a little bit more specific. I always kind of say that it was like an upside down triangle to keep boiling down while are there specific things that are the most challenging? Because obviously it's not going to be custom. So we need to figure out what could we change that is going to have the biggest impact on the most amount of people. Nice. And the most um, different types of disabilities. So that was a lot of trial and error of what part was it? You know, the, the one that was the first that was super clear, easiest one was closures. Absolutely, it was a challenge across the board, both for physical disabilities and cognitive disabilities. So just in case, you know, people don't necessarily know the difference, mm -hmm. a physical disability really does affect your body, how you use your body, um, your ability, your muscles, all of that, where cognitive can affect um, your ability to think the process. That's more of, you know, autism falls into that category. Down syndrome falls into that category. That it really is a, an, a thought process of, of doing, for example, a button and a buttonhole. So that was easy. 
Okay. I don't say easy, but that was a very clear one. Okay, great. We have that category. What else? Then it was in our, you know, being in conversations and focus groups and surveys, it was the notion of how much money this population was spending on alterations. Wow. And tailoring. They were spending on average as much on tailoring as they were on buying the product. Wow. So <clears throat> when you put that together, people with disabilities were spending twice the amount of able-bodied people on their clothing and accessory purchases. Because for example, if you were missing a limb, many times people would have that other arm altered so that you don't have a sleeve dangling off or <clears throat> one leg needed to be shortened a little bit more than the other or and, and, and. So when I thought about that, what could we do to make the product more adjustable? so that we could maybe ease the tailoring process a bit, the amount that they're spending. So making waistbands adjustable, making sleeve lengths more adjustable, making pant lengths more adjustable. So we could maybe <clears throat> cut out those ancillary costs of what it takes to make the product fit the body better with different, completely different shaped bodies. So that became the adjustability category. Okay. And then <clears throat> the third category of feedback that I heard was that basic ways to get the product on the body, such as like this sweatshirt, for example, there's no opening other than the, the head, the neck hole, um, and really putting it over my head and managing to put arms through the armholes. So if you are a person with a disability that cannot independently dress themselves, that requires another human to dress them, then that is a really difficult process. And this, what we talked about um, in, in the beginning of some takeaways, I always like to kind of put this in something practical yeah. that if anybody wants to really understand what that would be like, take your partner, take a, your child, take your parent and do a fun little uh, experiment of uh, put a sweatshirt or something even tight fitting over another person's head without them helping at all. Ah. Like not at all. And if anything, like not it, like even almost being like dead weight. Yeah. And see how easy that is. Cause I guarantee you it's, it's not easy and it's frustrating oh. and it's time consuming. So when we think about it from that perspective, how else can we get this sweatshirt on the body that might give people back a little bit of time in their life, a little bit of less angst. And yeah. that was, let's open it in the back. Yep. Let's go in arms first. Let's have it closed in the back. And a lot of that struggle has been dissipated. But wow. yet in the front, it looks exactly what everybody else is wearing, which is yeah, such looks a great. key part of, of kind of the premise of what we wanted to create. So that's where I kind of said, all right, I, I think we, we have enough to start with. Let's focus on these three categories of how we can modify mainstream projects products <clears throat> and fix those key areas. And that became kind of the foundation of the modifications that were developed. Uh, beautiful, beautiful. And I want to get into the business plan, uh, okay. but before that, I want to get into the emotion again. And, uh, you know, when you were telling that story of, of dressing someone, I thought, well, a little kid, I, I don't have kids, you know, babies, so I'm not sure that's like, but we have a dog. We have a rescue dog, a Rhodesian Ridgeback. And you're exactly right. If you put a sweater on them, you know, with has one hole and two paws, it's hard. <laughs> I can only imagine a, a human, right? So thank you for bringing that up. Here's a quick thing that hit my head. You said that people with disabilities are the largest minority. And you made a really good point about that we all are, you know, could be joining that group pretty soon. You never know, right? Uh, uh, or we already are there. And it's over a billion people. All of a sudden, my mind went, well, that's no longer a minority. I mean, one in eight is not a minority to me. That's, that's a majority of a lot of things, right? So I, I guess it just goes back to the size of, of the market. So um, here you are, you, you had a, a passion and thing in your heart with your son, and now you realize, wait a minute, it's not just about my son, 
This is about fashion. This is about, we could help a lot of people. You're in the fashion industry as what, as a, as a, what, what were you? What were you doing? Designer. I was a designer. Okay, great. I still didn't hear that. What was it? Oh, a fashion designer. I designed. Designer. Okay, so you're a yeah, designer. Yeah. You're a fashion designer. Got it. You know, the reason my wife used to produce fashion shoots for oh, you know, yeah. Gucci and all that. So I know how challenging those productions can be, right? And, uh, and working with designers and then photographers, you know, and, and everyone's got their own personality and, and, and whatnot. So you're in that world, okay? Yeah. And you've got a good idea. You've backed it up now with some real data. You know, you know yeah. the customer, right? Yeah. Tell me about the brands. How did you approach the brands? And what was it? I, I want a story. You know, what was it like? Did you get their attention right away? And did people just say, wow. Thank you. Or, you know, what was that experience and why Tommy Hilfiger? It's a great, great question um, about the, the reaction yeah. of the brands, um, because here's a, a, a critical kind of plot twist that when Runway Dreams was first started, it was a for profit. I knew nothing about the nonprofit world. I was always in business. At the time of actually starting Runway of Dreams, I had owned my own business. So when I felt I was ready to start approaching brands, I had everything that I felt I needed. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get past a, a first conversation with, with brands in that the, the reaction was always the same, that it was good for you. What a brilliant idea. But... If no other mainstream brands have ever done this before, that you can't even cite one brand that is an example, then we're not in a position to take a risk. We, we, there's a reason type of thing. So, you know what? It's one of those wonderful moments, I think, of being knowledgeable enough and being hopefully, as, you know, why this needed to happen, I think, later in my life. And, having experience in the business world is that I knew I needed to take a step back and say, okay, I'm hearing the same thing over and over and over again, and it's not changing. So I guess, I think that's the definition of insanity when you do the same thing. So I wanted to get ahead of that and say, so something- By the way, that, that definition, Einstein gets credit for it. I'm not yeah. sure it's true, right? Doing I the think same it thing. is true though. I think it is true, right? If I kept doing the same thing yeah. and expecting the, uh, a different result, right. that would be craziness. I so, think, yeah, we do that all the time, right? Human yeah. beings, it's crazy. Yeah. Okay. It's crazy. So, but I do think that had this happened earlier in my life, I don't think I would have had that foresight to say, uh, let's, let's, let's stop wasting time. Let's take a step back. What is my goal? My goal was to change the fashion industry to be inclusive of people with disabilities. The way that I was approaching it wasn't working. So how was I going to make this work? What were they saying to me? What they were saying to me was they were not willing to take a financial risk on something that has never been done before. Okay, so I felt so confident that the population was going to prove that there was this market, that <clears throat> this was worth investing in, that I needed to find a different way to prove that. And I felt that becoming a nonprofit where I could then approach the company at, with this concept and be able to say, look, if I am completely wrong, you're going to get a tax write-off. You will at least be doing something great for humanity. So let's give it a try. Wow. <clears throat> I tell you, the second we became a 501c3, that's when I was able to get meetings. Wow. It was a much softer, easier, okay, this does, it is the right thing to do. You're, everybody agreed with me that it was, the right thing to do and it was a brilliant idea but nobody was willing to be the first one out of the gate wow. to really really take a chance on this so thankfully my first meeting was with the team at tommy hilfiger my first real pitch meeting and 
honestly, the CEO of Tommy Hilfiger at the time is an extraordinary man, uh, Gary Scheinbaum. And he immediately connected and saw the huge opportunity for this, that he um, is, is really one of the reasons why we, we were able to forge this partnership. But I truly believe, had I not taken that step back yeah. and didn't kind of, I don't want to say sacrifice, but sacrifice in the sense that I went from potentially making this a full business to sacrificing my family and becoming a nonprofit, um, because I felt so sure that brands and industries were going to see the business opportunity and that I just needed to bide my time and something else was in store. Thankfully I did because that really helped with the birth of Gamut, but it really um, was a, a game. It was a, an important pivot that needed to be made at that, that stage of the game. What a great lesson for so many people. I'm glad that you brought that out. I didn't know that, right? We, this is kind of organic how it's coming out. But um, what a lesson for everybody, whether it's in business or life. If, you know, if, if, you're, if you're pounding your head against the wall or you're, you're paddling water uphill and it just isn't working, maybe you ought to look inward first and, and to take that pause. Right. And for you to actually say, wait a minute, maybe it's something that I'm doing or I could change. And to figure out the nonprofit route was just the perfect avenue. And to have the guts to do that and then bam, how it changes. I think we all could have a lesson in that. Right. I mean, have you I, I'm curious, has that happened in any other aspect of your life now as you look back? Um, uh, good question. Um only from the uh, from probably the hard lesson that we all learn when things just don't work out. I mean, I, I definitely had other you know experiences business wise where I thought I was moving in one direction and it was a failure. I mean, it wasn't even it needed you know a pivot; it just failed. Yeah. Um, so that kind of is a forced pivot that you can, you know, either stay down or pick yourself up. I would say with this example, it was something that I had control of. Yes. And I said, hang on, before this goes to Bustville, we have to really think through another way to circumvent this wall that is being, you know, placed in front of me. That's so cool. All right. So now to the story, because um, you were Tommy Hilfiger. Uh, what's the CEO's name again? It was Gary Scheinbaum. So first off, to get to the CEO is not easy. So you no. must have had some. I had some, great support. Yeah. OK, so bingo. Tommy Hilfiger signs on. And then what happens? Because I really want people to realize that this thing is taking off. Right. So tell me. So just to give some um, time frame parameters. This happened in 2016. So in 2016, prior to us signing the, the deal with Tommy, there were zero mainstream brands that even thought about people with disabilities, that even knew what the concept of adaptive clothing was. And so this was a huge revelation. It was actually uh, history making in the, in the fashion world. Yeah, absolutely. So, and especially because we were lucky enough to be with a global brand that other brands were like, wait a second, <laughs> what is happening and why aren't we getting involved in this? Beautiful. So <clears throat> just to fast forward a bit and kind of level set, here we are in 2022, and from the runway dream side of the house, one of the big things that we do is we do very large scale runway shows. Uh, we do one during New York Fashion Week and one we do in a, in a city that we travel to every year. So we just did one um, that can be seen on our YouTube channel in Los Angeles in March. And on our runway, <clears throat> again, 2016, we had one brand on our runway, Tommy Hilfiger. 2022, we had six mainstream brands. We had Tommy Hilfiger, we had Zappos, we had JCPenney, Target, Kohl's, and Stridebright, as wow. well as three um, brands that are more on the 
sorry, four brands that were on the small business side that are emerging adaptive brands. So even in our world, but most certainly in the fashion world, this is tremendous speed that so many brands have not only put resources and money behind the uh, adaptive products, but it is becoming a true category in the industry is really humbling and, 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 and almost awe-inspiring. It is awe-inspiring. I wouldn't say almost, it is. And, and what's cool is that um, you have figured this out, that you can do good, you can do the right thing, but also an approach that, you know, uh, is profitable for people, makes a difference, right? I'm thinking about, you know, not only fashion, fashion is leading the way in so many ways, but, you know, if you just think about the whole greenhouse effect, you think about uh, the uh, the uh, the climate change and all this, you know, they can learn from you. And that is, yeah, we know it's a good idea, but you've got to find the, the methodology or the path that will allow people to take that that risk, right? And you figured it out. And, and now everybody else is trying to come on board. They're coming to you, right? I bet you, uh, and, and that's a great thing. You know, that happened in my speaking career too. It's one of those things that, uh, you know, I don't know, do you know much about speaking bureaus and how speakers get hired? Yes. Yeah. So when I first started, which was two decades ago, you know, uh, they have all these big speaker bureaus, Washington Speakers Bureau, Kepler, all these big names out there. Right. And uh, I went to them and said, hey, you know, here's my story. I'd love to speak. And they're like, yeah, guess what? There's also a hundred thousand people who uh, have a good story in front of you. Yeah. They're, they're not, yeah. They're not only in front of me, they got a better story than, and, and, you know, whatever, you know, it's, it's not, we don't need speakers. We need clients. That's what they said. You know? Yeah. So I, I, I heard them loud and clear, just like you, I listened and I went, huh, no one's going to hire me. I need to bring the clients to them. So you have to start it out and you have to just, you know, uh, gut it out. And all of a sudden, um, one client becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight. And all of a sudden, these bureaus are getting calls asking about me and they're calling me. And yeah. that, and, and, and now, now you're, you know, the, everything changes, right? Because now there's a reason for them to partner with you, right? Yeah. And, and I think you are in that position now, right? They're coming to you and saying, hey, you know, Mindy, Runway of Dreams, how can, how can we support you? So that, that, let's lead now, because that leads me into your new business, which yeah. I think is phenomenal, right? So now you, your pivot, Runway of, of Dreams is working, all right, it's a nonprofit. And, and what, what was your next step? So really, it, it's again, I, I think the notion of really observing and listening and seeing trends. So when the request just started pouring into Runway Dreams for everything from being connected to people with disabilities to be in ad campaigns or in commercials or that notion of, we have to reframe who's in the public eye. So we were getting a lot of those requests as well as brands saying, well, we want to get into this industry. How do we do that? So suddenly we were getting requests that were so far outside of what the pr premise of Runway of Dreams was about and our mission um, which really is to raise money to be able to sustain our programming, which is our runway shows. We do college clubs, we do scholarships for uh, design students that are involved in the adaptive space. We're really, really helping the next generation. Yes. That wasn't in, at all in, in terms of what we do. So that's when a, a couple of things happened that I realized that we were going so far out of scope to be able to work with these companies. And more importantly than that, I didn't feel like it was authentic for a nonprofit to be representing people with disabilities. That's exactly what we're trying to be the opposite of, that we want people with disabilities to have the same representation as everybody else in the world. Yes. Or is it a, a nonprofit? IMG is in a nonprofit. All of these, you know, management companies or agencies and and <clears throat> consulting companies, not a one of them is a nonprofit. They're very much businesses. And how are we going out there telling businesses 
that this is a business opportunity when we're saying it from a lens of a nonprofit, it was just not jiving. So that's when I, I, I started developing the business plan for Gamut in uh, about 2018 and really uh, modernizing the notion of a management company. Because what we like to say is we, we manage humans. We're very human centric, even from the consulting arm of really working with brands on developing adaptive product, every step of the way includes people with disabilities, whether it is the product development, whether it's testing the product, whether it's advertising the product, we don't do anything without involving the population in, in the mix. And then on the talent management side, we work with the production companies to say, okay, great. You want somebody with muscular dystrophy? Wonderful. We need to do a site visit on the, on the set to make sure that it's safe for our talent. We wanna make sure everybody on set really understands what muscular dystrophy is. Um, our client needs a straw because they're not able to uh, utilize their hands for you know, all the breaks and they require at least a 20 minute break in between things that we would be <clears throat> naive to think that any production would know how right. they, and it's no fault of theirs is they're not being told. They're just saying, great, we need a talent with, with somebody with a disability and they hire them, but then they're not, they're, they don't know how to properly, you know, manage them. And it could be a very bad experience for the talent. So putting, you know, the, all of that together um, is what we kind of call our, our new age management company. That is so, so cool. And I'm glad to see you, you know, start with a vision and it just expands, right? And, and you start to see all these other opportunities to really help people. I know I, I mentioned my wife uh, for 20 years, she produced fashion shoots and, and just listening to her, uh, most people outside of, you know, the fashion world have no idea of how complex this is, right? And what you just mentioned about, you know, hiring a talent, quote, talent, who has a disability, now, you know, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that yeah. really needs to be considered, especially for the outcome you're looking for, which is, you know, other people to, to want to do that. So I see the need. Wow, you must be uh, a lot of people. How do people get, I'm hoping people are listening to this right now. And if, if one in eight people are have disabilities, you got a lot of people who either do have it or know of somebody. So how can they get a hold of you to uh, help in this cause? Actually, the, the statistic for the United States is, is about one in four people have a disability. So why does the US have more? Well, those, that's because we have the census and whatnot. So it's a little bit easier to grasp okay. those numbers. Okay. Um, and every kind of demographic is understanding a little bit more about disability, okay. putting a name to a disability. So those numbers are growing exponentially. Okay. To the point that there are some researchers that feel there may be a time that there will be more people with disabilities on our planet than not. Wow. So unbelievable. So how do people get in touch with us? Um, if you are interested from the nonprofit side that you want to get involved in volunteering or our programming or anything of that, please go to runwayofdreams.org. Uh, from the business perspective, if you are interested in how your company can start to think about getting um, involved in the adaptive space, whether that's internally um, through HR, creating IRGs, all of that, to developing product, gametmanagement.com. And if you are a person with a disability or have a loved one, the only requirement we have to joining Gamut and being one of our talent is you have to have a disability. That's it. Everyone is welcome. Wow. You're going to get busy. <laughs> I mean, I, I think you already are. Yes. Um, so, so that's what a huge offer for people. I, I, I can just see if I'm listening and I know someone and our producer, Greg Sugar, told you, you know, his daughter has a disability. So I'm sure all the, the bells and whistles are going off in people's heads of uh, just the aha that, that you um are talking about here. Let's talk about some of the outcomes that you're seeing, some of the good, the good works from your goodwill. Uh, give me a story, you know, tell me a story of, of some really joy. It's because of what you've done. 
I'm going to give you two, if that's okay. Yeah. One from the perspective of the population and one from the uh, uh, brand. Um, so we had an experience when we did a show in Vegas. Uh, we did a show with Zappos. And um, we had, I think in that show, we probably had about 50 models with all different types of disabilities. One of our models was a young woman, I think in, in her early 20s, who um, had a limb difference. She had a prosthetic arm and lived in Vegas, and we all know the temperature in Vegas. And up until this stage, this point in her life, she had never worn short sleeves ever because she did not feel comfortable showing her arms. She was embarrassed. She really never met anybody else with limb difference or really understood until she was asked to be in our show. And being that we have our, our shows, again, people with all different types of disabilities, but they really get to know each other because it's, it's, a, it's a deep day of hours and hours together, rehearsals, all of that. So she, for the first time in her life, actually got to meet other people with limb differences and prosthetics. And by the time it was her time to go down the runway, she was in buckets of tears that she has never felt more comfortable, more valued, more ready to kind of show the world who she really is and proudly wore uh, a, a short sleeve top, proudly showed her arm. And it was prolific for lack of a better word to be a part of somebody's life so profoundly to be able to witness such a change in something that that she will take with her for the rest of her life uh -huh. and felt so seen and so, felt so valued was exactly what I hope that we can continue to do by raising this awareness by putting people with disabilities on our runways by having global premieres and 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 being able to broadcast this to the world that people with disabilities are just people. They're people first before anything else and their disability most certainly does not identify who they are, it doesn't determine it. It is a, a piece of them for sure. And in many cases, they're very proud of that piece, but it is, they are people, they are humans just like everybody else. So that was really something I will, I will take with me every day that I feel so lucky that I was a part of that. And then from- Well, hold on real quick. I want to comment, yeah. but that's that's so cool. And I'm sure that's not a lone story. You know, no. there's so many of those so stories. Um, you know, what just went through my mind is just the self-esteem that you're helping people yeah. with, right? And, and that confidence, um, just being able to be called a model. You know, I mean, our yeah. society, you know, has this idea and, and I- I'm not saying it's bad that, you know, models have, a, a, have actors have this, you know, cachet and, and how cool to be called a model, you know, when you may have, yeah, that's awesome. Okay. Okay. Give me one, your other story. Go for it. So my other story is actually what we just announced on the view um, when we were on at the end of March. And actually, if I may, yeah, they're re-airing it again on April 21st. So if you missed it the first time, they're rerunning it. Um, at on the view at 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard, but okay, we'll get that in the show notes. But just to be clear, yeah. 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on the 21st of April. Of April. Nice. Yeah, yeah. watch the view. Uh, I actually saw part of that show that it, it's on the internet. I think I'm mean, I, yeah. I, your website. Yeah. 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 And you were awesome on it. It's good to see Oliver there, by the way. He looks great. You got him looking really good. And his confidence level. How about that? Yeah. And I and I do really think this experience has helped shape that confidence for him to show up dressed how he wanted to, be able to speak so freely and so confidently. Yeah. I think it's because he has felt valued and a part of something. And a part of a community, but but the piece that that I think is so exciting is that we announced on that show that we partnered with Victoria's Secret. Nice and here, yeah, so exciting um, through Gamut and and why that's so enormous and profound is here we have one of our largest global brands that has 
really been so focused, you know, previously, definitely not in the past couple of years, they've, they've really rebranded. Um, but on, you know, the perfect body with the angels and the, yep. and now kudos to them that they're taking a step back and saying, we are not serving all women. We yep. are not currently serving women with disabilities. And we need to really understand what does that mean? What do we need to learn? Um, how do we better serve them? And ultimately, what is that product going to look like? And I, it is such an important message to the world that if Victoria's Secret is really putting so much effort and, and business acumen behind this, it is a, it's trailblazing. Wow. And it, I, I know because I can't wait to announce the other brands that we will shortly announce, but this will absolutely reshape the way our world um, thinks about people with disabilities. So cool. I mean, I can only imagine. And uh, uh, and that you're at the, the tip of the spear in your company, right? Uh, it's it's what do you see happening in the next year or two? Give me the future. Um. I see Gamut really uh, becoming the, the true go-to company for all industries that want to get involved in the adaptive space, want to understand people with disabilities, um, and, and growing to an, you know, an extraordinary level. But the other piece of Gamut that I is so important is, first of all, we are committed to a minimum 50% of our team to be people with disabilities. Um, all the way up at the top, um, through all levels, um, and to really help bring down this horrible percentage of 80% of people with disabilities are unemployed, eight zero. Really? So, yes. So if we can do our job to help even bring that down in any percentage points and really give people with disabilities a voice, a job, and importance in this world and reshaping it yeah. that is as important to me as it is to help the brands wow you know that just really struck a chord um a voice a job and to reshape the world you know that's powerful right yeah, that's changing the world that's a purpose larger than self you know yeah. that's making 100 percent. wow that's glad to be here to me right i yeah. mean that's being glad to be here, making a difference. What does what glad to be here mean to you? I, I just, that's what it means to me. What's, what's glad to be here mean to you? I, I think that's really what attracted me the most to when, when you connected with me, that, that line and that notion of it, because I, I really try to wake up every day and say, I am so glad to be here. I am, I am so grateful that I get to do what I get to do. I'm so grateful that Oliver chose me to be his mom, as well as of course my other children um, and, and my husband, but that I get to be a part of people's life in a way that I think most people may not get to experience in, in their lifetime. That is an enormous glad to be here. Boy, was I glad to be here to have that experience with that talent in Vegas. Wow. Lucky me. I love that. You know, that's what's neat is every day, right? I like what every you said. Every, every day. day. Every it's day. Little things. It's not just the big things like these big brands and all this stuff that's happening. Uh, I think it's it's the it's the little things that are changing people's lives uh, at their heart level, right? Yeah. And you're doing it. Wow. That is so cool. Hey, um, I, I want to start to wrap up, but I want to think about a couple of uh, things and make sure we uh, we, we cover them. Uh, the I was just thinking about impact you can make. You know, the the uh, obviously there's a lot of veterans out there who are are disabled, right? Do you have a have you thought about how to uh, approach that segment of the of the disability power? Well, veterans actually were um, a big part and still are of um, our talent pool. First of all, we have a lot of veterans involved in Gamut, um, as well as our focus groups when we bring in people to work with brands. Um, and even from my iteration of my you know research year, 
that was such an important population that I needed to have a voice in this. They had the story of leaving one way yeah. and coming home another way and, and managing through the daily things of getting dressed wow. is a colossal change and the dignity. That's yeah. a huge, huge word that I haven't um, really spent time talking about in this session is that's a very big part of the, the population of people with disabilities that this happened during their lifetime. Yeah. They woke up one day or had something happen that altered their body, their ability, but it didn't always alter their, their mind or who they felt or how they were, how they wanted to show up to the world and the dignity that they had. And when you cannot wear, because you physically cannot dress yourself, in what you could before only adds to that downward cycle, right? Of, of, of the, the enormous mental impact that so many of our veterans have to face when they, when they come back or, or, or their abilities are, are augmented, et cetera. So if we can help with that piece in their life to make that a little bit easier and be able to wear whatever they wanna wear that is a huge impact. So their their voice specifically is always very important to sharing with our, our brand partners or in focus groups and any way that I'm able to. Well, I love that. And, and I'm thinking that it's also, um, there's so much opportunity because there are so many nonprofits out there. Like I live in Sun Valley and, and we have one out here that we work a lot with that deals with not just veterans, anybody that, that needs it. It's called Adaptive Sports. and um, uh, and, you know, I'm just thinking there's so many good people out there that, that you must know and will know uh, that just kind of coordinating all of that and giving them a, a place to go like Gamut uh, is, is so powerful. It, it can help because they all want to do that. You know, they all want to achieve the, uh, the dignity and that self-esteem. And, and you have a real path to that right now. So that's really cool. I hope I hope you get a chance to reach out. I hope people hear that. Uh, and uh, It'd be great. Hey, how did you get the name Gamut? Where did that come from? So when we kind of did the the deep dive and you know, worked with a, a, a brand agency, I really wanted something that was neutral feeling, but also extremely powerful. I wanted something that would make a mark, be disruptive. And the definition of Gamut is that it truly like it runs the Gamut it's inclusive, it's, it's from A to Z. It's everybody that would fit in between here and here. And it's almost a little limitless. And that really represents our population, right? It's, it's everything runs the gamut. It, every, there's so many iterations of everything, but our world isn't really you know, running the gamut, so to speak. Um, and which is why we wanted to change that narrative. I love it. That's a great, I was wondering how it came. That, that, that's a great name for everybody. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking too, Higher Ground is the uh, the group here that, that, that we help support. There's, um, uh, we give 10% of all our fees to charity and we we help to support foundations like yourself, nonprofits that are making a, a difference. And as you start to do that, you realize just how many people are out there doing good works. In fact, I can only imagine you need a big staff around you because you do not have a, a, a lack of opportunity, right? There is a, there's a, big opportunity there and it's just funneling it and, and making it happen uh, a couple of brands hit my name uh, my wife worked with american eagle i don't know i know what you can or can't say uh, but i can only imagine some of the brands you're coming out with and how about you know some of the the big names right um uh, that's gonna it's gonna happen i guarantee it, it I can, yeah nice yeah. Nice. Hey, let's do this real quick as, as we wrap up. I always like to, to touch into your heart and your wisdom, you know, and uh, uh, you've done so many things and are currently are doing so many cool things. Uh, what are some either, I call them live wits, maybe they're quotes, maybe it's, uh, it's an inspiration that somebody gave you. How do you live your own life? What, what would you like to share with people? Two things. Uh, the first is, and I don't know who said it. I don't know if I said it <laughs> or I heard it somewhere, yeah. but um, the notion that one idea can change the world. Ah. And, what it, and, and truly the definition of changing the world could mean changing one person's life. 
Yeah. It change one outcome. It doesn't have to be as prolific as, as hopefully what we are going to do through Gavin and Runway Dreams. If you change one thing in somebody's universe, that's changing the world. Yeah. So do it. I, I, I think that that is, that's like, that I think really stops people sometimes that it's overwhelming or, uh, you know, I don't know where to begin. Just do it. One idea can change the world. And the other, and it's really a guiding principle for, for Gamut is if you can't see it, you can't dream it. Mm -hmm. And that really goes to, you know, that's why we have to change visually who people are seeing. I need this population. I need my son, Oliver, to be able to look in a magazine, on a film, in a commercial and see somebody that looks like him so that he knows that that's an option for him. I want to see somebody, a, a CEO that is missing a limb or in a wheelchair or, and not just one or two, I want to see it all over the place. So that's really a guiding principle of, of Gavin also. Wow. Love those two. Uh, what it just reminded me is you're, you're going to see it soon because I believe the world's coming from us, not at us. Oh, so, I love that. I go. love that. I'll share it with you there. And, and once you believe that it just happens, you're going to start seeing it all around you. I love so, it. Mindy, thank you for being uh, our guest. Thank you for what you're doing for so many people. My glad to be here statement is you've definitely made this last hour a joy of my life because I can, I can see in my mind what you're doing for so many people to change the world. And uh, I'm so grateful that uh, life came together for you. Keep it up. Uh, and thank you for being here. Glad to be here. Over to you. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful. Thank you for this huge opportunity. And it was equally as much of a joy for me. So I am extremely glad to be here. Thank you, Mindy. Runway of dreams. Gamut. Keep up with your success. Glad to be here. Gucci out. <laughs>